Good evening. Welcome to our final Wednesday evening worship service uh, in this season of Lent. I know next week we're into Holy Week and uh, going to be doing the Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. So I hope uh, that's a blessed time for, for you here, and I'll be back in Flanagan. But uh, it's good to be with you one last time. I might not see you until December, so uh, this will be farewell for now. But uh, yeah, we'll be around, but I don't know if I, because I'm busy on Sunday morning, so I don't even know if I'll see you on Sunday. So. <laughs> but uh, it's been a blessing to be able to come up with you and, and do this uh, uh, the series with my, my dad, and uh, so I'm just uh, glad to be back here one more time. At this time, I invite you to rise as we begin our worship service with our opening prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this season of Lent where we have focused on your cross and and we draw closer to that time where we celebrate the crucifixion and, and look forward to that day when Jesus rose again. We ask that you would help us to always cling to the cross and boast in the cross and, and make the cross the center of our life because there Jesus uh, won our salvation and, and uh, gave us peace. We ask that you would help us to experience that peace tonight and, and in our lives every day. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We gather together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us make confession to God. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and penitent sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have offended you, and for which I justly deserve your punishment. But I am sorry for them, and repent of them, and pray for your boundless mercy, for the sake of the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ. Be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Forgive my sins, give me your Holy Spirit for the amendment of my sinful life, and bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for us, and for His sake forgives us all our sins. Through His Holy Spirit, He cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of God, who called us out of darkness into the splendor of His light. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of God, Church of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be, oh, we stay, you stay, do you sit down for the, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure what you guys do, but stay standing for we listen to our opening hymn, sorry.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we walk together through this season of Lent, help us to see the cross of Christ more clearly than we have ever seen it before. Show us your amazing grace and mercy and love. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we are strengthened in our faith and energized for the task of sharing the gospel message with the world. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this evening comes from from 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the Corinthians in chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. And and, uh, I know my dad looked at this, uh, a passage right after this, a few weeks ago, talking about the foolishness of the cross. Uh, This comes right before that passage that he looked at. And what he is writing this letter about is he is writing to a church that's very divided. And so here we begin to see some of that, and I'm going to look at some of those divisions in my sermon as well, but here we get a glimpse at those divisions. Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, My brothers, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, it's the other name that Peter went by, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And our second reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Let's sing our our hymn, hymn number 613, Thy Holy Wings.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, one day St. Peter was up at the pearly gates and he was uh, greeting some of the newcomers coming into heaven. And one that day just happened to be, there was three of them, and one was a Methodist, and another one was a Baptist, and the third was a Presbyterian. And as each man stepped up to Peter, he would ask them a question, which denomination do you belong to? And so the first one said, I'm a Methodist. And St. Peter looked down at his list and he said, well, welcome, you're going to be in room 24, down the hall on the right, but as you go down the hall, be quiet near door number eight. And then the next man stepped up, and Peter asked him which denomination. He said, well, I'm Baptist. And so Peter looked at his list, and he says, you're in room 17, but that's going to be on the left side. But as you walk down, try to be quiet as you go past uh, door number eight as well. Then finally, the third man stepped up, and he asked him which denomination he belonged to, and he said that he was Presbyterian. And so he said, well, welcome. Head down to room number 11, but please, as you pass room number eight, be quiet. And This time, the third man, before he started heading down the hall, he turned to St. Peter and he said, I can understand there being different rooms for different denominations, but why do I need to be quiet as I go past room number eight? And St. Peter said, well, that's the Lutherans in room number eight, and they think they're the only ones here. (laughs) Well, I don't know if you've heard that joke before, maybe. (laughs) Sometimes there's different groups that are kind of the butt of that joke. But uh, it's, it's humorous, but it's also a little sad because not only are we divided by denominations, we're also divided within those denominations. We're, you know, as Lutherans, you have the ELCA and the LCMC and the NALC, and the, my grandparents belong to the AFLC, and so all sorts of different Lutheran groups. But even within our congregations, and I'm sure that's never happened here, never been divided, anything like that. But that's the reality that we, even as Christians, can be pretty divided. And the reason why I bring this up is because the title of my sermon for this evening is, He is Our Peace. But it's kind of an interesting title because when the world looks at us Christians, they see all of these divisions, all of this fighting over doctrine and and hierarchy, and all these kinds of things, and, and they kind of laugh and say, really, this, this claim that Jesus is, is your peace and unity, and, and you guys can't even get along yourselves. <laughs> but that's what, <clears throat> excuse me, but that is what the Bible proclaims over and over again, is that Jesus Christ and Jesus alone is our peace. But before we get into how Jesus really is our peace, I want to look at why some of the reasons why we're so divided, and, and those reasons why we're divided in the church are the same reasons why we're divided in all other areas of life. Everywhere you go, everywhere we find human beings, there's going to be division. <laughs> because wherever there are humans, there's going to be human pride and human selfishness. That happens in the church and it happens outside the church. Human pride threatened to divide and even destroy some of the first Christian churches. We see that in the Galatians letter, but also the reading for this evening in the Corinthians letter. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote to this group of Christians, they're the Christ followers, and they were already very divided. This is only a few decades after Jesus died on the cross, and they're already getting all angry at each other. And that's why he said, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you would agree. It's not that you have to think all the same thoughts and just be on the same page about everything, but we should all be focused on Christ. And he goes on to say that, I've heard from Chloe's people, so someone sent me a message that some of you say, well, I follow Paul, and I follow Apollos, and I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. This passage in 1 Corinthians reveals one of the ways that our pride divides us, and it's the pride of the different groups that we belong to. We love to create different groups 
for different reasons, and then we boast in those groups. Insiders, outsiders, winners, and losers. Our groups give us an identity. They make us feel special and important. And we see this playing out in all sorts of places, whether it's race or gender, sexuality, nationality, political parties, birth, you know, what family we belong to. Is my family a good family or kind of a low family? All that kind of stuff. We come up with these different ways to group each other, and then we try to figure out which group is better. When I go out in public wearing my Cubs hat, I am proudly declaring that I'm part of the particular group of Cubs, you know, baseball fans that roots for the Cubs. <laughs> when it comes to baseball, I belong there. That's my group. It was, it was kind of tough living up in the Milwaukee suburbs the last few years, a few years ago, because everywhere I went, I was surrounded by Brewers fans. But the good thing was that while I was living up there, the Cubs won the World Series. So it was a lot easier to stand tall and proud and wear those Cubs hats while I was there. Well, the Christians in Corinth, they were divided in these different groups and specifically over which teacher that they were going to follow. They all knew these different guys. Paul had come and another missionary named Apollos. He was a a well-known and important teacher at that time. But they even had Team Peter. You know, they were going around wearing hats with Team Peter on it. Peter had been there and visited them and preached there. And some of the people were saying, well, I got you beat because you guys got uh, Peter and Paul and Apollos. Well, I'm on Team Jesus. (laughs) They were trying to show who was better, whose group was better. Well, in the last few years in our own culture, in our time right now, we've seen this kind of boasting happening all over the place. And one of the phrases that's kind of come up and and begun being used to describe the way that we group each other and then we try to show how uh, proud we are of those groups is there's this term, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called virtue signaling. Virtue signaling is when someone makes some kind of public statement, usually on social media, maybe Facebook, Twitter, all those types of things, and they do that as a way to show which group they are a part of, who that they support, that they are part of a righteous group, a virtuous group. Virtue signaling is also a way to shame others who aren't part of your group. This creates constant pressure to show where we stand. Are we inside? Are we outside? Are we part of the group or not? Are you righteous, virtuous? Where where are you at? Happens all the time. We take pride in our groups and we signal to others how good we are. But that pride divides us and even causes animosity. We're also proud of the power that we have. We're proud of uh, the, the wealth or the status that we have. And, and it, maybe if we don't have those things, then we resent the people that do. The ancient city of Corinth was, was an important Greek city when Greece was a, a big major empire. They had a population of almost 90,000 people. It's pretty big. But in 146 B.C., when the Romans kind of came up in power, they came in and completely destroyed the city of Corinth. It was a major seaport, major hub of economic activity, and they leveled it to the ground. But about 100 years later, Julius Caesar came in and said, I want that city rebuilt. And so they rebuilt it slowly over time, and a lot of the people that came and settled into that city were what were called freedmen. They were former slaves, and so they were set free, and they could go, and they could settle in this new city. So when Corinth was rebuilt, it became a place of of opportunity. Uh, Not a whole lot of places in that time had had the the ability, gave you the ability for social uh, mobility, going from the lower classes up to the higher classes, or to seek economic wealth. They kind of, they had their, their different groups, and you were there, that's where you were. So Corinth became kind of like America in in a very small sense that you could pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you can make a name for yourself. At least that's what they thought of themselves. And Paul begins dealing with this in his letter to the Corinthians 
because there seems to be great pride in the social and economic status of the different members of the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes to them saying, When you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. Paul was shocked that there is this hierarchy. Some people were hoarding all of the food and all of the wine that was used for communion. They were eating it all, and some people were getting nothing. He said, if you want to get drunk, do it at home. When you come to church, at least at church, you should all be on the same plane, same level playing field. Some of the Christians believed that they were more important, whether it was social status or wealth. We don't know exactly. But another part of Paul's letter, he goes on to describe how people were boasting in their power spiritually, their spiritual power. He, in, in, first, in first Corinthians chapter 13, which many of you probably hear at weddings, maybe you even used it at your wedding, that was actually not written for weddings, surprisingly. It was written for a divided church. Paul wrote that love passage saying, if I speak in tongues of men or angels, if I have this special language that I can communicate with the angels, but if I don't have love, then I'm just making noise. Just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have all prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all sorts of great faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, then I am nothing. And if I give away all that I have, showing how generous I am, and wow, look at, look at me, look at all the good things I've done. If I deliver up my body to be burned as a martyr for God, for Jesus, but I do not love, then I gain nothing. Paul was condemning all the ways that the Corinthians had become proud of their power whether it's spiritual power or social power or wealth, all those things. Whether we hear it in messages like today, what do we hear? We hear, well, the rich need to pay their fair share. I'm not trying to defend the rich, but we hear all these things like, well, they, 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 you know, they need to do this. Or, or maybe a wealthy member of the church thinks that their voice has more power because they give more to the church, right? You know, that, that, that means they should have a, a louder voice, a louder opinion. We hear all these ways that power and wealth and status come out, and we're proud in it, and it causes division and resentment. Well, finally, we see that pride, another way that pride works in our hearts is the pride of intellect or the pride of being right how that causes divisions. In 1 Corinthians, another division that had gone, been going on, Paul was confronting this issue of eating food sacrificed to idols. Now, that sounds kind of odd, and it's not something that we're probably ever going to face. But the real issue was that some of the Christians in the city of Corinth, there's pagan temples there, and some of the Christians felt, you know what, those idols... They're nothing but stone and wood. They're not real gods, which means the food, food, whether it's meat, if it's been sacrificed to that idol, that idol is nothing. And so the sacrifice means nothing. I can eat that. And Paul says, well, yeah, you're kind of right. But guess what? There's something more important than being right. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, all things are lawful when it comes to that, that particular issue. All things are lawful. All, you can eat all things, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. In other words, being right is not the most important thing in the world. <laughs> I know that's pretty shocking, right? Everybody loves being right. For example, the Bible does not forbid drinking. It doesn't forbid drinking alcohol. There are places where it forbids getting drunk, but it does not forbid the drinking of alcohol. Now, would it be good and helpful if you went and started drinking beer or wine right in front of 
uh, an alcoholic, someone you knew was an alcoholic, it wouldn't be helpful for them, it wouldn't be good for them, it wouldn't build them up. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Our pride for being right. Well, it's not bad for me. (laughs) And all those things in life, we love to be right. Often in our conversations, we'll stop listening to other people. Even if, you know, even if it's just an a regular old conversation, we'll stop listening and start to formulate in our minds our responses before they're even done talking. (laughs) And I admit that I can be bad about that. And that's something that I need to work on. I think about, you know, how Jason and I might be having a conversation and and it might not be something important, but I'll just start before she gets done. I stop listening and I start wanting, thinking about what I'm going to tell her in response. Because I think that what I have to say is more important than listening to her. I mean, we we do it in all sorts of, that's just a small way, but we do it in big ways too. Our pride and our desire to be right hurts our ability to listen, to care for one another, to think about the needs of others and where they're at in their, their faith and their life. Our pride to be right divides us over and over again. In this world, we work and we strive for peace, but our efforts are what Martin Lloyd-Jones calls a secession and hostility. So there are going to be times where we can kind of set our pride on the shelf and, and maybe we can figure out how to get along and have some type of semblance of what seems like peace, but he says that's just a cessation of hostility. He goes on to say, merely to not fight is not peace. Peace is positive, not negative. Peace means love, sympathy, understanding, a true unity, and the world knows nothing about it and cannot produce it. Think of a marriage that has become a competition. A husband goes off to work where he accomplishes lots of stuff. He earns good money and receives praise from other people while he's at work. But then when he comes home, there's no praise for taking out the garbage There's no sense of accomplishment for changing another diaper or doing another load of dishes. There's no payment for helping out around the house. It's just not quite the same. Or a wife, whether she stays at home or works, might feel like she's completely underappreciated and undervalued. She goes to work, takes care of the kids, keeps the house clean, gets food ready for dinner. Sure, dad helps here and there, but she's go, go, go all the time. Everybody wants something from mom. You ever notice moms or grandmas, how the kids never ask dad. <laughs> it's always, mom, 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 hey, mom, 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 mom. There's a shoe missing or whatever. If it just, I mean, it happened multiple times today already. But then once the kids have gone to bed, dad wants something for mom too, right? <laughs> Competition in our marriages, in our lives, naturally grows and can lead to division and animosity. Who is more important? Who is more valuable to the family? When do I get to relax? When do I get my downtime? I work all day and no one shows me any appreciation. All those things keep come creeping up and that's the pride in our heart. A cessation of hostilities, whether in marriage or between nations, anything in life, is not actual peace. It's not the peace that God wants us to have. The only thing that will give us true peace is that, it, that is filled with love and joy and mercy is the cross of Jesus Christ. He is our peace. And this is true in two specific ways. The cross of Christ declares that we, me, you, on a personal level, that we are hopeless on our own. In Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, if through the things that we do, then Christ died for no purpose. What he's talking about is that if you could get to heaven on your own by keeping the law, by being good enough, then Christ died for no reason. But the fact that Christ came and died for you means that you need it. In his book, Hidden Christmas, Pastor Tim Keller clarifies this for us. He says, there has never been a gift offer, offered that makes you swallow your pride to the depths that, 
that the gift of Jesus Christ requires us to do. Christmas, and then eventually the cross, but he's, in his, this book he focused on Christmas. Christmas, the incarnation, means that we are so lost, we are so unable to save ourselves, that nothing, nothing less than the death of the Son of God Himself could save us. That's how lost we are. That means that you are not somebody who can pull yourself together and live a moral and good life. You just can't do it. It will not get you into heaven. Our pride wants to deceive us into thinking that things are not really that bad. But the cross of Christ speaks to us and says, no, you really are that bad. But guess what? You have a Savior who loves you. In another letter, Paul says that we are dead in our sins. And that's true of all of us. Because when we receive that and we recognize that and we accept that, we also begin to see that that's true of everybody else. Everyone else is also captive to sin, and everyone else is, is in this place where they cannot free themselves. They cannot do it. Everyone else is also filled with the same pride that causes all those divisions. Every single one of us needs the forgiveness that comes through the cross of Christ. We're all the same. Everyone in our world wants to be equal. We want equality these days. Every group wants equality. Well, we have it. When we look at the cross, we are truly equal. We are equally sinful. We are equally proud. We are equally arrogant. We are equally dead in our sins. We are all equally incapable of saving ourselves or anyone else. We are all equally in need of a Savior. This is where we find our true unity. It's where we find our unity. We come to the cross and we realize how desperately we need a Savior. And on the cross, we find true peace. Jesus takes all of our sinful pride and our arrogance, He takes it away from us. So the Bible tells us that Jesus actually takes it from us, and He takes it upon Himself, and He hangs on the cross, and He says, Father, forgive them. He takes it all away from us, and He leaves God's grace and mercy and love Jesus is like a giant sin sponge. He soaks it up and he pours it out on the cross. The cross removes everything that we boast in. The only thing left is the grace and forgiveness of God. So it gives us peace with God and it gives us peace with one another. That forgiveness is complete, and eternal, and free. It is the grace of God for sinners like you and me. Nothing now Nothing separates us or divides us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it this way. He says, we are one in sin, we are one in failure, we are one in helplessness, and we are one in hopelessness. We believe in the one and only Savior together. We receive the same forgiveness of sins. We are equally children of God. By grace, we share the same divine life we have the same hope of glory and we all look with admiration and praise and rejoicing and glory into the same face of the same Savior. He is our peace. He is our unity. Nothing now divides us. When we are in Christ, nothing divides us. Jesus Christ unites us in God's love and He is our peace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for sending Christ to die on the cross to be our peace. Help us to realize and, and confess how desperate we are for a Savior and to see how desperate everyone else is for a Savior. Open our eyes to see the peace that Jesus offers us through the forgiveness that you give us and help us to share that forgiveness with the world and be your messengers of peace. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I invite you to rise as we confess together our faith following along on the screen. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, I am not my
You may be seated as we listen to our hymn, When Peace Like a River. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are all filled with pride in different ways. We are proud of the different groups that we are a part of, and and we use that pride to, to condemn others and to shame and guilt others. We're also so proud of the things that we accomplish or the things that we have instead of thinking of them and and believing that they are really gifts that you have given us to use as blessings in our lives and the lives of others. We're so proud of of, uh, being right and, and winning arguments that we fail to see the ways that people are hurting around us or in need around us. We ask that you would take that pride away. Through your through the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would cleanse our hearts And give us new hearts, right hearts, clean hearts that cling to the cross of Christ. Help us to always, always realize and and accept and, and to believe that we need Jesus every day. That we need his love and his forgiveness and his grace every single day. Help us to cling to his cross where we see our salvation and our forgiveness. Help us to see everyone else through the eyes of Christ, who sees not people who are his enemies, but sees people who are captive and in need of of saving. Help us also to see the people around us, see their suffering and their need and their hurt and their pain, so that we can share that gospel with them, that Jesus is with them, that Jesus does love them, and he has died for them too. We ask that you would bless us and and make us one, whether here in this congregation or as Lutherans or as Christians all over the world, help us to cling to Christ, unify us, strengthen the bonds of brotherhood between us, help us to grow in that unity and give us peace that passes all understanding so that we together might be your light in this world. We ask that you would bless us this evening, give us peace in our homes, give us peace in our families, give us peace when we go to work. We ask that you would be our peace. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, and we ask that you would remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand and receive the sending blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us listen to our final hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.